The Education of Little Tree by Forrest Carter. Mr. Wine, page 892. He had come all through the winter and the spring once a month, regular as sundown, and spent the night. Sometimes he'd stay over with us a day and another night. Mr. Wine was a back peddler. He lived in the settlement but walked, to the mount, walked the mountain trails with his pack on his back. We always knew about the day he'd come, and so when the hounds bade me and Grandpa would go down the holler trail to meet him, we'd help him carry his pack to the cabin. Grandpa would carry the pack. Mr. Wine usually had a clock with him that he let me carry. He worked on clocks. We didn't have one, but we helped him work on his clocks on the kitchen table. Grandma would light the lamp. Mr. Wine would put a clock on the table and open its insides. I was not tall enough to see by sitting down, so I always stood on a chair next to Mr. Wine and watched him take out little springs and gold screws. Grandpa and Mr. Wine talked while he worked on the clocks. Mr. Wine was maybe a 100 years old. He had a long white beard and wore a black coat he had a little round black cap that sat on the back of his head. Mr. Wine was not his real name. His name started off with Wine, but it was so long and complicated we couldn't get it straight, so we called him Mr. Wine. Mr. Wine said it didn't matter. He said names was not important. It was more or less how you said it, which is right. Mr. Wine said some Indian names was beyond anything at all that he could say proper, so he made up names himself. He always had something in his coat pocket, usually an apple. One time he had an orange, but he could not remember anything. We would eat supper in dusk evening. Then while Grandma cleared the table, Mr. Wine and Grandpa would sit in rockers and talk. I'd pull my chair between them and set too. Mr. Wine would be talking, and then he'd stop. He'd say, It seems like I'm forgetting something, but I don't know what it is. I knew what it was, but would not say nothing. Mr. Wine would scratch his head and comb his beard with his fingers, and Grandpa wouldn't help at all. Finally, Mr. Wine would look down at me and say, Can you help me remember what it is, little tree? I'd tell him, Yes, sir. More than likely, you was toting something in your pocket that you couldn't recollect. Mr. Wine would jump straight up in his chair and slap at his pocket and say, Wang dangle me. Thank you, little tree, for reminding me. I'm a-getting so I can't think, which he was. He'd pull out a red apple that was bigger than any kind raised in the mountains. He said he run across it and picked it up and was intended to throw it away as he didn't like apples. I always told him I would take it off his hands. I stood ready to split with Grandma and Grandpa, but they didn't like apples either, which I did. I saved the seeds and planted them along the spring branch, intending to raise a lots of trees that give up that kind of apple. He could not remember where he put his glasses. When he worked on the clocks, he wore little glasses on the end of his nose. They were held together with wire, and the handles that went behind his ears had cloth wrapped around them. He would stop working and push his glasses up on his head while he talked to Grandpa. When he started back to work, he couldn't find them. I knew where they was. He would feel around on the table and look at Grandpa and Grandma and say, Now where in devil's torment is my glasses? Him and Grandpa and Grandma would all grin at each other, feeling foolish that they didn't know. I'd point to his head, and Mr. Wine would slap himself on the head, total stump that he had left him there. Mr. Wine said he couldn't work on his clocks if he hadn't been there, if I hadn't been there to help him find his glasses, which he couldn't. He learnt me to tell time. He would twist the hands of the clock around and ask me what time it was and would laugh when I missed. It didn't take me long before I knew everything. Mr. Wine said I was getting a good education. He said there wasn't hardly any youngins at all my age that knew about Mr. Macbeth or Mr. Napoleon or that studied dictionaries. He learnt me figures. 
I could all, already figure money somewhat being in the whiskey trade, but Mr. Wine would take out some paper and a little pencil and put figures down. He would show me how to make the figures and how to add them and take away and multiply. Grandpa said I was might near better than anybody he'd ever seen doing figures. Mr. Wine gave me a pencil. It was a long and yellow. There was a certain way you sharpen it so that you don't make the point too thin. If you made the point too thin, it would just break, and you'd have to sharpen it all over again, which used up the pencil for no need at all. Mr. Wine said the way he showed me how to sharpen the pencil was the thrifty way. He said there was a difference twixt being stingy and being thrifty. If you was stingy, you was as bad as some big shots which worship money, and you would not use your money for what you had ought. He said if you was that way, then money was your God, and no good would come of the whole thing. He said if you was thrifty, you use your money for what you had ought but you was not loose with it. Mr. Wine said that one habit led to another habit, and if they was bad habits, it would give you a bad character. If you was loose with your money, then you would get loose with your time, loose with your thinking, and practical everything else. If a whole people got loose, then politicians seen they could get control. <clears throat> Excuse me. They would take over loose people, and before long you had a dictator. Mr. Wine said no thrifty people was ever taken over by a dictator, which is right. He had the same consideration as me and Grandpa for politicians. Grandma usually bought some thread from Mr. Wine. Little spools of thread was two for a nickel, and there was big spools that was a nickel apiece. Sometimes she bought buttons, and once she bought some red cloth with flowers on it. There was all kinds of things in the pack, ribbons of every color, pretty cloth and stockings, thimbles and needles, and little shiny tools. <clears throat> I'd squat by the pack when Mr. Wine opened it on the floor, and he would hold up things and tell me what there was. He'd give me a figuring book. The book had all the figuring in it and told how to do it. This was so I could learn to do figuring all through the month. I got so far ahead each month that when Mr. Wine come by, he was total stumped. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mr. Wine said figuring was important. He said education was a two-part proposition. One part was technical, which was how you moved ahead in your trade. He, he said he was f for getting more modern in that end of education. But he said the other part you'd better stick to and not change it. He called it valuing. valuing. Mr. Wine said if you learnt to place a value on being honest and thrifty, on doing your best, and on caring for folks. This was more important than anything. He said, if you was not taught these values, then no matter how modern you got about the technical part, <clears throat> you was not going to get nowheres at all. As a matter of fact, the more modern you got without these va values, then you would more than likely use the modern things for bad, destroying and ruining. Which is right, and not long after that was proved out. Every once in a while, we had a hard time fixing the clocks, so Mr. Wine would stay with us a day and another night. Once he brought a black box with him, which he said was a Kodak. He could take pictures with it. He said he was not very good at it, taking the pictures. He said some folks had ordered the Kodak and he was taking it to them, but he said it would not hurt it at all or show any use if he'd taken our picture. He'd taken a picture of me and of Grandpa, too. The box would not take the picture unless you was facing direct at the sun, and Mr. Wine said he was not, he was not to look, not took up with the whole contraption anyhow. Grandpa wasn't either. He's suspicious of the thing and would not stand but for one picture. Grandpa said, you never knowed about them things, and it was best not to use anything new like that until you found out what would happen over a period of time. Mr. Wine wanted Grandpa to take a picture of me and him. It took us practical all evening to take it. Me and Mr. Wine would get all set. He would have his hand on my head, and we would both be grinning at the box. Grandpa would say he couldn't see us through the little hole. Mr. Wine would go to Grandpa and get the box leveled up and come back. 
we would stand again and Grandpa would say we would have to move over a ways he, as he couldn't see anything but an arm. Grandpa was nervous about the box. I suspicioned he figured there was something in it that was liable to get out. Me and Mr. Wine faced the sun so long that neither one of us could see a thing before Grandpa finally got the picture took. It didn't work out, though. The next month when Mr. Wine brought the pictures, mine and Grandpa showed up plain, but me and Mr. Wine was not even in the picture that Grandpa had taken. We could make out the tops of some trees <laughs> and some specks above the trees, which after studying the picture a while, Grandpa said was birds. Grandpa was proud of the bird picture, and I was too. he taken it to the Crossroads store and showed it to Mr. Jenkins and told him he had personally taken the picture of the birds. Mr. Jenkins couldn't see good. Me and Grandpa worked at it for might near an hour pointing out the birds, and he finally saw them. I figured me and Mr. Wine was more than likely standing somewhere down below the birds. Grandma would not have her picture took. She would not say why, but she was suspicious of the box and would not touch it. After we got the pictures back, Grandma was taken with them. She studied them a lot and put them on the log over the fireplace and was continually watching them. I believe she would have stood for a picture after that, but we didn't have the Kodak as Mr. Wine had delivered it to the people who had ordered it. Mr. Wine said he was going to get another Kodak, but he didn't, for this was his last summer. Summer was getting ready to die. Dozing away the days at the ending, the sun commenced to change from the white heat of life to a hazing of yellow and gold, blurring the afternoons and helping summer die. Getting ready, Grandma said, for the big sleep. Mr. Wine made his last trip. We didn't know it then, though me and Grandpa had to help him across the foot log and up the steps of the porch. Maybe he knew. When he unstrapped his pack, there on the cabin floor, he'd taken out a yellow coat. He held it up, and the lamp shined on it like gold. Grandma said it reminded her of wild canaries. It was the prettiest coat we had ever seen. Mr. Wine turned it round and round in the lamplight, and we all looked at it. Grandma touched it, but I didn't. Mr. Wine said he didn't have any sense and was always forgetting things, which he was. He said he had made the coat for one of his great grand young'uns, which lived across the big waters, but he made the size for what his great grand young'uns was years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. After he got it made, then he remembered that it was a total misfit. Now there was an, anybody could wear it. Mr. One said it was a sin to throw something away that could be used by somebody. He said he was so worried that he couldn't sleep because he was getting old and couldn't stand any, any more sin put on him. He said if he couldn't find somebody which would favor him by wearing the coat, that he reckoned he was total lost. We all studied on that for a while. Mr. Wine had his head bowed and looked like he was done lost already. I told him I would try to wear it. Mr. Wine looked up and his face broke out in a grin amongst the whiskers. He said he was so forgetful he had plumb forgot to ask me for the favor. He pulled himself up and danced a little jig around and said I had totally lifted a sin and a big load off on him, which I had. Everybody put the coat on me. Grandma pulled on the sleeve while I stood there with it on. Mr. Wine smoothed the back, and Grandpa pulled the bottom down. It fit perfect, as I was the same size as Mr. Wine had remembered his great grand youngins. I turned round and round in the light for Grandma to see all sides. I held out my arms so Grandpa could see the sleeves, and we all felt of it. It was soft and slid smooth and easy under our hands. <clears throat> Mr. Wine was so happy that he cried. I wore my coat when we ate supper and was careful to keep my mouth over the plate and not spill anything on it. I would have slept in it, but Grandma said sleeping in it would make it wrinkle. She hung it on the post of my bed so I could look at it. The moonlight coming through my window made it shine even more. Laying there looking at the coat, I determined right off that I would wear it to church and to the settlement. 
I might even wear it to the crossroads store when we delivered our wares. It appeared to me that the more I wore it, the more sin would get lifted off Mr. Wine. Mr. Wine slept on a pallet quilt. He laid it out on the floor of the setting room across the dog trot from our sleeping rooms. I told him he could use my bed as I liked to sleep on a pallet, but he would not do it. That night as I lay a bed, somehow or other, I got to thinking that even though I was doing Mr. Wine a favor, maybe I ought to thank him for the yellow coat. I got up and tiptoed across the dog trot and eased open the door. Mr. Wine was kneeling on his pallet and had his head bowed. He was saying prayers, I figured. He was giving thanks for a little boy who had brought him so much happiness, which I figured was his great grand young and across the big waters. He had a candle lit on the kitchen table. I stood quiet, for Grandma had learnt me not to make a noise while people were saying prayers. In a minute, Mr. Wine looked up and saw me. He told me to come in. I asked him why he had lit the candle when we had a lamp. Mr. Wine said all his folks was across the big waters. He said there was not but one way he could be with them. He said he only lit the candle at certain times, and they lit a candle at the same time, and that they was together when they did this for their thoughts was together, which sounds reasonable. I told him we had folks scattered far off in the nations and had not figured such a way as that to be with them. I told him about Willa John. I said I was going to tell Mr. Willa John about the candle. Mr. Wine said Willa John, he'd understand. I plumb forgot to thank Mr. Wine for the yellow coat. He left the next morning. We helped him across the foot log and Grandpa had cut a hickory and Mr. Wine used it as he walked. He went down the trail, hobbling slow, using the hickory stick and bent under the weight of his pack. He's out of sight when I remember I had forgotten and I run down the trail, but he's far below me, picking his way along. I hollered, thank you for the yellow coat, Mr. Wine. He didn't turn and so did not hear me. Mr. Wine was not only bad about forgetting, he couldn't hear good either. I figured coming back up the trail that him always forgetting He'd understand how I forgot, too, even though I was doing him a favor wearing the yellow coat. End of chapter.